Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. Lord, we haven't come into the house to hear from a man or a woman. We don't go to church to hear from people, Father. We go to church to hear from you. You want to speak to us tonight. You want to set us free. You want to give us directions. You want to heal our bodies. You want to bless our lives. And we're a grateful people for that. So we've come to hear from the teacher of the church, who is the Holy Spirit. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. Now as you bless us, we're grateful, but we ask also that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ this night. If they're preaching the gospel, we love them. We're on their side and we're grateful for them. So as you bless us, bless them. And Father, we'll give you all the praise, give you all the glory, give you all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody say, Amen. Amen. Before I even give you the title, now that we've prayed, I just want to mention to Marilyn and, and Bob Pitts, or raise your hand, guys. I uh, just got back last week from Mongolia. I mean, who the heck goes to Mongolia? I'm, uh, I'm just really grateful that they went. But I, I was with Baron yesterday. And he told me, you guys didn't even stay in a hotel. You camped. Three days in a camp, in, in a tent, right? On the floor in Mongolia. Oh, my goodness. Thanks a lot. You are radical Christians that we all want to get to including me. Profound words of Jesus, subtle trap of judgment. As we go to these title, the profound words of Jesus and the subtle trap of judgment, I want to just share some things about life for you so you can understand maybe where you're at and where I'm, I'm at. There's different levels in the progress as a Christian or as any person. The first thing, the first and the lowest level is just trying to figure out really if there's even a God at all. We probably all went through that question ourselves, a question whether there was really even a God. I mean, some of you that are in this room today are still having trouble with just that basic thinking because the whole world is trying to convince you that there isn't a God. And you're sometimes going to be convinced by them and go the wrong way or you're going to finally go to the next level and realize that there is a God, and he's a great God. Then that, at that level, you start to realize that there are a lot of people who claim to have their God as the God. So you ask the question at the second level is, like, who's really God? And if you're like me, and as a young man, I, I really wanted to find out about who was really God, I really researched it all, and realized there's some really weird thinking out there but there's one that was really solid and I came to a place at third level of realizing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is God, Almighty, Lord, and Savior of everything. When I got to that level, another question people ask themselves in the progress of their life is they ask themselves, okay, now that I believe in Jesus, what do I do? And you go to a church for many years that you don't do anything. You just go to church and they tell you about God, you know, and they tell you about what Jesus did. And they sing some songs and they give you a little Reader's Digest suggestions on how to live life. And, you know, you're really kind of like figuring out. But somewhere along the line, inside of you, there's an unsettling in your spirit in that level. And you really start to reach out. Now that I know about Jesus, how do I find out about him and how do I really find out about, you know, what's this all about for me? Why am I here? What's this about? What does God want and require of me? You know, and so I couldn't find that out at that particular level and where I was going to church. And many years back, I decided to find a place that would teach me truth. And that fourth or fifth level, you start to question yourself, like, what's truth? That guy says that's truth, and that guy says that's truth. That group says that's truth, and this group says that's truth. And there's a lot of them. I mean, a lot of people in those groups, and surely they couldn't all be wrong, so it must be truth. But I found out that that's not how you decide what's truth. 
you go to the next level, realizing that truth comes in something that's very interesting. It's the inspired word of God, the Bible. And for thousands of years, it has proved itself as the direction for your life. That God loves you so much, cares about you so much, and your future, he wants to give you insights on how to prosper in every area of your life. So you've got to find out the truthful, right way of doing things. And so you don't go back to the way world does things. You don't go back to what the politicians tell us. Oh my goodness, aren't we a mess if we listen to them? They can't even do things right themselves. What we do is we go back, not to what the majority of people in America say. We go back, not to what the Supreme Court says. We go back to the book of truth, which is the Bible. And you finally settle it in your heart that the Bible is truth at that particular level. And then you're going to have to come to a place in your walk where you realize if it's truth, then i got to find out how to live life based on what God says and not what I feel or what other people have told me, you know. And so that's where we're kind of looking at the Word of God, which makes me very proud of the Rock Church World Outreach Center. It doesn't, you know, play games with you. It's going to tell you all the time you're coming in here what the truth of the Word of God says, why, so that you can get it, apply it in your life, be blessed, and start to win some battles instead of constantly losing battles in life. If God really cares about you. And I'm really proud of this church that we do that in this place every time we get together. A lot of times in trying to adventure into truth, the word of God, we find ourselves in a place where we see God's warnings. Some people that aren't very smart say, and I read the Bible as a bunch of do's and don'ts and rules and regulations, and it's like God says big killjoy in the sky, and he really, you know, gives me a bunch of rules. And that's just not the way it is. When God gives us a warning, he is simply pointing out a pitfall that keep us from falling in a hole in our adventure and pilgrimage on this earth. Because he loves us so much that he not only tells us, listen to this, watch this, what to do, he tells us how to do it, then he empowers us to do it with his Holy Spirit. And in fact, and then he tells us to about look out for certain areas of your life so that you don't fall in the hole. It's like a father says to his children, he says, I don't want you to play in the street anymore. Car, I don't want you to play there. Get out of the street. Go play in the front yard or in the backyard, but get out of the street. And a little kid is just frustrated as can possibly be. And he's just angry with his dad for getting him out of the street because it was a perfect place to play ball. And then the dad sits down and says, I wanted you out of the street because the cars come by so fast that if they hit, they hit you, they'll squish you, they'll kill you, and you'll not be around us, and I won't be able to love you, you won't grow, and it's for your own protection that I told you about this, and I warned you about this. And now the little child is in a different place because now he understands what the father was saying and that the father was saying it because he loved him so much he pointed out the pitfalls. That's what you find in scripture is you find the father loving us so much that he points out by warning us of the pitfalls that we could fall into and never get out of and fail in life if we don't continue to follow the patterns that he sets for us by truth. Are you following me? Yes. You got to follow me because I'm very simple and it's very clear and somebody ought to say amen yes. because it's so easy for us to see. So what we're talking about tonight is a subject. In fact, Jesus is teaching his disciples in the first part of Matthew an awful lot, actually all the way through Matthew and he holds nothing back to them. Just like we teach you, we consider you going on the path of maturity. We don't hold anything back. There's not a game. I remember as a young man being part of a denomination and they said, you can't understand the Bible. You've got to 
let us translate it for you so that you can understand it. In fact, you shouldn't even have a Bible. And that's the way it was when I was a young, young man. And I went to that particular church. They spoke Latin. They didn't even care about having anything whatsoever that was English. So I, I, I grew up not knowing anything. And I'm in this place tonight telling you that this church treats you like you're going on the road to maturity, learning how to live your life according to the word of God. Guess what? So that you can be what God wants you to be, and that's blessed. And God comes along and he talks about something called judgments. And when you and I operate in a principle that is contrary to his way, it literally is a hole that we could fall into and keep us from being all that God would have us to be. Can, can I get a witness on that? Yeah. And so he loves us enough to point out things and he's telling his disciples, it is like he's telling us today about this word judgment and judging other people. By the way, if I could just share it with you, judging is a very normal and natural feeling that we all have. And the only way to get rid of it is you have to work at it or you will keep doing the judging because it's very normal and natural. It comes with the fall of man. In fact, the very first family of Adam and Eve had two sons, if you remember Cain and Abel, and Cain ends up, how'd you like to have a family like this? You, some, some of you think your families are bad. Here's the first family on, on the planet, Adam and Eve's children, and Cain kills his brother, Abel. There's murder in the first family. Oh my goodness sakes, alive. And all of us in here need to learn a simple principle that there's judgment. There's a, he judged his brother a certain way and he judged his God a certain way. And that principle brought him to failure right off the bat. Fourth chapter, book of Genesis. Right off the bat we see judgment. There's only one judge, his name is God Almighty. And he passes the judgment from himself as father to his son, Jesus Christ. We'll show you that in the scripture tonight. Now, in order for us to understand this, I'm going to take you to four places. Instead of just saying to you, now watch, listen to me. Instead of just saying to you, you shouldn't judge, which you'll hear in a moment from the scripture. Isn't it better that a father says, get out of the street because of this, this, and this. And then the child understands it. And Jesus is talking to his disciples. He makes a statement very blunt and up in front. But you'll find that the disciples later on in their writings define it greater so we can understand the whys. And the four areas that we're going to be talking about is the trap of judgment. It really wants to trap you. It wants to stop you as a Christian. It wants to keep the blessings from you. It wants to keep you void of the presence of God so you never get what you're doing. Never get the blessings. Never get the answered prayers. Never get the promotions. Never get the favor of God because you're operating in a principle in your life that's contrary to what, and it becomes this amazing horrible trap and most people don't know they're in a trap and when you don't know you're in a trap can I just say this to you you will never try to get out of it if you don't know you're in it and a lot of people don't even know they're in this trap of judgment and they never try to get out of it the second thing we're going to see is not only you're going to be trapped you're going to see what losses there are in your life because along with a trap comes devastating losses that's the purpose of it. Their satanic principles do not want you to gain, do not want you to prosper, do not want you to be successful. Third thing we're going to see is the why. Because if you tell me why to get out of the street, that makes a whole lot of sense to me. I'll get out of the street. Some of you need to know the why. And number four, the plan of God that takes care for Christians' judgment. So we don't have to worry about it. I find that if you know these things, then when this natural phenomena comes your way that wants you, you want to open your mouth to judge somebody, you'll know better as to why you shouldn't do it, and it'll help you not to do it. Is that okay? 
I want to just share this with you. Passing, if I could, if I, if I could do this, let me define for you if I may judgment. Passing an opinion or a conclusion to a matter of or something or to someone. If you are going to pass along an opinion or, and I love this word conclusion, conclusion. And God tells us that at nowhere and in no place are we to pass a conclusion of our opinion upon somebody or someone's act or them as a person because it stops us, it goes back to us. I remember, you know, someone said one time, well, I, you know, I, I have a jury duty. When I go to jury duty, I just tell them, the Bible says I can't judge, but he's not talking about civil courts. And I, and I see my friend Steve back here as a judge in uh, San Bernardino, sits on the bench in San Bernardino. And Steve, you judge every single day, and man, are you in trouble. <laughs> no, I'm only a kid. I'm only kidding you, man. I'm only kidding you. That's your job, and that's what you're supposed to do. But for us judging people outside of the law of our nation, outside of our civil duty, just because it's a thing to do, man, is it wrong. Definitely, absolutely wrong. I'm going to take you, if I may, to Matthew, the seventh chapter. Jesus, again, is speaking to his disciples. And, he's, and I love these words because they're so profound. It seems so simple, but yet they're so difficult for all of us because we all have a tendency to open our mouth and talk about people. Oh, <laughs> I got one amen. The rest of you are liars because you know that's true. So let's try it again. Uh, we all have a tendency, including Pastor Jim, to open our mouths and talk about people. Amen. About half of you, the rest of you, will cast the devil out of you after church service for lying. And, uh, but it's so true. Here it is in, in Matthew, the seventh chapter, verse number one. He says these words, judge not. And then he tells you about the trap, because here's the trap. He not only tells us to judge not, in other words, don't judge these things, don't judge people, because there's a reason for it. That's not your place, but there's a reason for it. And the first thing we're going to see is the trap. Is that okay? And the trap here is judge not that you be not judged. And he goes on to make this statement that if you judge, then you're going to be judged. Listen to what it says in verse number two. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with a measure you use it, it will measure back to you. In other words, whatever portion of judgment you're dishing out, you're going to get the same thing back. It may not happen right away, but it will happen. And that's the real trap of this. You can get away with a lot of stuff oftentimes, and you think you got away with it for God. Guess what? It's just not reckoning day, that's all. And you have to understand there isn't anything you're getting away with. God hadn't looked the other way, and, uh, and, and you need to be a person that realizes, be smart enough to realize if you got away with it, you think this week, next week's coming. And he makes this statement, and he's not going to break his word for you or me. He's telling his disciples this. Verse number three comes along and makes this statement. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eyes and do not consider the plank in your own eye? Verse four. Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. And I love the first word, verse number five. You know, I love about Jesus. Everybody thinks he's kind of milly-mouthed, sissy, kind of like kind all the time, never says hey, Can I tell you something? If there's anybody that's in your face, it's Jesus. Hypocrite. And when you are a hypocrite, oh my goodness sakes, don't expect to get blessed by God. And then he's telling these guys, can you imagine these guys that are following him? They're probably complaining about each other. They're probably frustrated with, you know, relatives, some of them relatives. They're following Jesus. And all of a sudden, Jesus goes, says, judge not. And they're going, what are you talking about? You know, you, you, and then he uses the word hypocrite. I understand using the word hypocrite towards the Pharisees and the scribes. And things, but here are these people that, you know, are with Jesus. They're learning like you and I. 
And we ourselves, even though we have an association with Jesus, can be a real hypocrite by the words that we speak about other people. Is anybody listening? First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Very important for us not to judge because the trap is this. Because the way you judge is the way you will be judged. Didn't say the way you judge you might be judged. It's the way you will be judged. And if you judge greatly towards somebody, you're going to get judgment back greatly. And I don't know about you, but I don't want judgment. I want blessings. Anybody want blessings? Give out a share here. Then this is something that all of us need to realize that in our walk with God, it's really a commandment from Jesus, right from his heart, for us to open our mouths only in kind words, blessing each other, praying for each other, taking care of each other. Can I tell you something about America right now? The reason it's got such division and strife going on is because a bunch of people are judging other people, including some Christian people. And we need to be a people that just shut our mouths. If you don't know how to not judge, may I give you some words of wisdom? Shut up. <laughs> Two words. You saw someone, I said that one time to a lady uh, in a church service like this when I was young. And I said, shut up. And she came up to me after church service and says, hey, in my family, we don't say shut up. And I said, oh, good. Well, when I come to your house for dinner, I won't say shut up. But in this house, I'm saying shut up. <laughs> But God says it oftentimes in scripture, man. Just shut up. If you don't know how to not judge, don't go in. When someone starts, have you ever felt that when someone starts to judge? And you say, are you judging? And they say, no, I'm just sharing. <laughs> we have answers for everything, don't we? Uh, are you judging? No, I'm just considering. I'm just saying something, you know. It's a judgment. It's something that is, if it's not good, don't say it. Amen. Remember that old saying? Yeah. Yeah, that came from my dad. Why do you think my dad said that to me? He had to teach me that because everything that was coming out of my mouth was like Cain. Always complaining about everything and everybody else. Stop complaining. Stop seeing people as bad. Start speaking life over them. Oh, it's so important. The second thing I want to share with you tonight so that you can understand this because it's important is number one, this is a trap, but number two is the loss. I love this. If there's a trap, you're trapped, and in the trap, you will have a loss. Now, wait a minute. I want to make a statement to you about the loss. This is a crazy statement. The Spirit of God spoke it to me today, just this afternoon. He said this, and I, I have it up on the overhead for you. It says, if I'm not forgiving someone, then I'm in judgment of that someone or person. Let me say it again. If I'm not forgiving someone, <laughs> don't you wish you went to Calvary Chapel tonight? And uh, if, I'm, if I'm not forgiving someone, then it says, then I'm in judgment about that someone or person. And with that in mind, I take you to Mark, the 11th chapter, and here's his fabulous instructions on how to get answers to prayer in Mark 11th chapter. Some of you know it, some of you don't. Some of you know it by heart. Many of you don't know it at all, and you should know it. We just sometimes know it so well that we forget to teach it to you because it's been part of our life for so many years. He says these words in verse 23. It's not up on the overhead. It says, He say unto you, whatsoever you say unto the mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea, and believe those things which you say will be done. You will have whatever he says. And then verse 24, he says, Therefore I say unto you, whatever things you ask when you pray. Has anybody ever asked anything when they pray? Have you ever asked anything when you pray and you see it what you're asking for, but you're hoping that God's going to give it to you. Don't, you're all afraid to raise your hand on that one. You little chickens right now. Christian chickens. You're afraid if I raise my hand, then I know that's a, thank you, Terry, you're the only honest person in the building. Okay, a couple of others. 
you're praying and what you're really saying is, God, I hope you to give this to me. I hope I need this. I want answer to this prayer. And, and, and you leave it where you're on the outside instead of on the inside. The first comes along and makes it very clear. Now, this is just a little footnote. And he says, believe that you receive them and you will have them. So when I pray, I'm not to see myself on the outside hoping that he answers my prayer. I'm to believe that I receive it. And at that time, it's a done deal. I got it. It won't be long before it manifests itself. Well, the verse goes on, and this is the next part of that verse, that gives you a warning once again. Remember we talked about forgiveness. If you're not forgiveness, you're in, you're in judging, and uh, you're judging that person. He says, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anybody, I mean, can I ask you, is, is judgment anything against anybody? Does he just say, if you have anything against a bad person? Now, if you have anything against your boss, because he's been a real creep this week, <clears throat> anything against your spouse, you know, pff, yeah, forget that person. Anything about your relatives. Anybody ever had feelings about relatives besides me? I mean, I had such feelings about relatives, I had to get away from them. Start my own family traditions, you know what I mean? Whew, man, that was a zoo get together and have a party with them. They'd all be drunk playing poker and before I'd know it, man, I was, there was a fist fight in the backyard. You say, really, Pastor? Yep. Guess what? I, I solved that problem. I just got away from them. But if you have anything against anybody, that means anybody. That means your kids. That means your husband. Hey, can I tell <laughs> That means your exes. I can't mean the exes. <laughs> yeah, it means the exes. I know. I got a pile of them. I probably married everybody in this building. <laughs> I'm kidding. Half the people online just went off. <laughs> and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. Why? Because you're in... You're, you're judging. And that your Father in heaven will also forgive you of your trespass. Now watch the loss. Verse 26. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you of your Oh my goodness. I mean, this is a very serious thing, this thing called judgment. Because if you're in judgment and you're in non-forgiving position and because of, of, of non yes, somebody hurt you. Yes, they did wrong. Yes, they violated you. Yes, they were absolutely, yes, they got away with it, sort of. Guess what? But there's no reason that you should judge them. Let God do it. And there's a day coming when he will. Because the Bible says, vengeance is mine. And when you pick up a spirit of vengeance... You've just taken the place of God. And you're in trouble. So the loss here is neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. Because why? You were in judgment that left you in a place of non-forgiveness. So we see something about judgment. We see the trap. We see the loss. How about this? Just for our own insight. This is really cool. The why we don't judge. The why. Because if you know the why, then you'll get out of the street faster. Is anybody listening? And it's all through this scripture, if you'll go with me, into 1 Corinthians. And let's take a look at the 4th chapter of 1 Corinthians. 4th chapter of 1 Corinthians, uh, let me move there. Verse number 5, it says this, Therefore judge nothing before the time. Until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness. Boy, isn't that going to, he's going to tell on who's, who's done the right and wrong. Watch this. Watch this. And reveal the counsel of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. But you know, not only each one's praise, but vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And so all we have to do is shut it. You may feel it in your heart, don't express it out of your mouth. 
And when someone else is expressing judgment about someone else, your answer ought to be, I don't want to go there with you. Or I think they're wonderful, even though you may not. Or God's, how about this one? Not finished with them yet. Because remember, if you remember this word, that judgment is passing conclusions about something or someone. Conclusions. What you're saying by passing judgment is that person is finished and God's not finished with them yet. In other words, therefore judge nothing before the time. I mean, I use the illustration over the years of a picture, a portrait. If you saw what a painter was painting in the beginning as he sketched out where he was going with his picture, you would say it's pretty lousy or try to figure out what it is. When he starts to put the different colors on and layers on and textures on and feelings on, you know, then it becomes a real picture of great value. But here we see that oftentimes we judge a human like the beginning with an artist in a picture. God's not finished with him. Therefore, judge nothing before the time. What's the time? The time when Jesus comes and gets us. Then it's too late for anything else, and the one who's supposed to judge, he will judge. Is anybody listening? So we find out that there is a trap to stop you from your future. We find out that there's a loss that'll keep you from God's forgiveness and keep you from answered prayers. Remember the couple verses right before that, he said, just believe you receive it and you'll have it. Guess what? If you're not going to get it if you're still in judgment and not in forgiving. And now we see the reason why. The reason why is because God's not finished with anybody yet. You say, well, I hate that person. I hate what they did. You may hate the act. Don't go there with the person. May I say this to you? To be all fair, 1 Corinthians 6, chapter verse 14, it says that we have the right to judge what's spiritual, not the right to judge a person. Because God's not finished with them yet, but spiritually, he's got it all under control. Is anybody listening? So we see the loss. Now we see the reason why. Last one, get you out of the street, is we see the plan. And the plan is very important. There is a plan that God the Father has that is for everybody. And that plan is for those that are in Christ Jesus will be judged by Jesus. <laughs> Let me say it again. <clears throat> in other words, I could screw up. I know you don't believe that. You just think I'm like M -m wonderful. All of you that believe that, raise your hand. Three of you. <laughs> but I could screw up. But at the end of my life, am I in Jesus? And when the judgment comes, God doesn't see my screw up. He sees my Savior. God doesn't see my failure. He sees his blood. And my judgment is based on Jesus. If you're born of the Spirit of God. Not based on what I've done and haven't done. And I say thank God to that too. That's called grace. <clears throat> so the plan for mankind because it's all part of our nature to continuously judge things and walk in unforgiveness and be in this trap that would keep us. It's not based on my perfect work, even though I strive to be like Jesus, and so should you in every area of your life. But my job is not to strive to be in Jesus and sit back and do nothing. My job is to realize that I can, by the power of the Holy Spirit, clean up my act to be a blessing to God and to his plan. And therefore, when judgment comes, I'm found in him. And you'll have to go through Jesus to get to me. 
And that's the great plan. Let me just share a couple of verses with you, if I may. And I'll just pop them up on the overhead. In 2 Corinthians 5.10 says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each may receive the things done in his body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, in order to understand that, you'd have to go to 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. In your life, you're going to produce either gold, silver, or precious stones. Or you're going to produce wood, hay, and stubble. That's what he describes it like. And at the end of life, in the judgment, the flame of God is going to hit the work that you do. If it's gold, silver, precious stones, it doesn't burn up. But if it's wood, hay, and stubble... It burns up. Are you following me? And so that's what he's talking about there, whether it be good or bad. The, the flame of judgment is going to come upon it. You yourself are not going to be judged. Just notice this, the work that's in you. If you will, go with me uh, to Matthew, the 16th chapter, verse 27. Matthew, the 16th chapter, verse 27, says it like this. For the Son of Man will come in glory in his Father uh, with his angels. Oh, glory. How about tonight? And then he will reward each according to his work. That's where the rewards come in, 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. But I like Romans. Here's Paul writing in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he writes this, Romans, the second chapter, verse 16. Romans 2nd chapter verse 16. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men. How? By Jesus Christ. Man, you better be in Jesus. You do not want to be judged by God based on who you are. Like, I'm cool. I, I have a lot of money. I had a great education. I'm really nice. I really got along with society. I'm, I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat or I'm a pedestrian. I don't want to vote for anybody. And uh, <laughs> I think that's where I'm at. And, uh, and so, you know, uh, so you better be in Jesus Christ. According to, and I love the way Paul took this and made the word personal. He says, my gospel it was so personal to him that it became his. If I stood tonight and said to you, I want to preach to you my gospel. Now, I'm going to preach to you tonight my gospel. All of you would have gotten up and walked out and hit me with a chair on the way out. <laughs> Yet Paul can make this statement according to my gospel. What does he mean? According to the word of God that became his, you need to make the word of God yours. <clears throat> and keep in mind that God, because he loves you so much, is trying to get you out of the street. And he shares with you about the trap. He shares with you tonight about the loss. He shares to you tonight about the reasons why, because it's before God comes, it's before it's time. God's not finished. And he reasons, gives you the plan. Here's what to do. When the emotion comes up to open your mouth and judge, shut up. Now watch this. Here's a verse. I was one of those young theologians as a young 20-year-old. And uh, you know, I've been a theologian for 40 years. And so... Uh, as a young 20 year old it made me crazy because I just I came out of you know denominationalism and I was so frustrated so angry with the church so frustrated with people and all, all the junk that goes on and I criticized on a constant basis constant basis you know they're too dead they're too crazy they're too you know nuts they're too they're too this they're too that they're too this they're too that and this verse popped up one day when I was teaching the book of Romans in the beginning of this church that changed my life. I want to share it with you. Romans, the 14th chapter, verse 4. Who are you to judge? And I like the old King James. It says, another man's servant. Whew, another's servant. Who are we? Are we arrogant enough to pass judgment and to condemn and to come to a conclusion about somebody when God's not finished with him yet. And he says this, to his own master he will stand or fall. Indeed, he will <clears throat> be made to stand for God is able to make him stand. 
In other words, I don't care what condition he's in today, God's not finished with them. Come on, somebody ought to give the Lord a great big praise. <clears throat> so the warning is not a killjoy thing, and the warning is not something to stop you from enjoying life. The warning is actually something that enhances your life if you operate in it. Keeps the flowing and the blessings of God, keeps his presence in your life and in your family. And that's what this is all about, is looking at the word of the Lord and seeing some tough verses like that verse. Realizing it's a warning, but it's a good one that helps us. If God spoke to you tonight, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. You know that? <clears throat> some of you in here haven't even taken the first step to receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Listen to what I'm going to say to you, and then I'll let you go. But you got to hear this. Can I just say it to you? <sighs> I already know you know who Jesus is. You wouldn't be here if you didn't. And sometimes we humans are so silly. Hope this is not you, but some of you it is. That we think because we know who Jesus is. You know, we celebrate Christmas every year and celebrate Easter every year of our life. Because we do that, we think we're Christians. We kind of have the mentality, you know, we're born in America. You know, we're not Muslim, we're not Hindu, not Buddhist. So therefore, I guess we're Christians. And nothing could be further from the truth. Because here's the truth, here's the truth, here's the truth from the scripture. Are you ready? Look at me now. Everybody look, 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 look up. It's not what you have in your head. You already have him there. It's what you've done with your heart that gets you into heaven. Now watch this. Some of you that are in here, even though you hear my words, won't listen. And you're going to miss heaven by 18 inches. Because Jesus will always be in your head and you haven't yet brought him down to your heart. That's the difference. And some of you think you can go to heaven because you're real good, but the Bible makes it very clear that you can't get to heaven because you're good, you know? Some of you think you're going to heaven because your mom and dad told you you're a Christian. You can't be a Christian because your mom and dad, even if they had you baptized or christened as a baby, took you to catechism, Sunday school or Sabbath school class. You remember those classes? They were the ones that bored you out of your mind. They took you there and they said, now you're a Christian, baloney. Because you can't get a, become a Christian because you went to those classes. No. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get to heaven any other way except by him. His way, he tells us in scripture, how to get to heaven. Now watch this, watch this. Now think about it for a moment. You got to think about this just for a moment. He's a beaten, bloody mess. Nailed to the cross. Blood pouring out everywhere. He dies. He's resurrected from the dead in the third day. Because he wants you to go to heaven. But he leaves it up to you to decide whether or not you're going to go. And how you're going to get there. I don't think so. He tells us exactly in the scripture how to get to heaven. Exactly. He doesn't leave it up to me. He doesn't leave it up to you. He doesn't leave it up to some well-meaning church committees. No! He tells us exactly how to get to heaven in the scripture. He says these words, you must be born again. Now when I say the words born again, churches all, it seems like all around in America, they, people turn off immediately because they've been trained by the media that born again people are idiots and fools, fanatics and radicals. But that's not what he's talking about. Born again means this. Here's what it means. So you get this. I want you to get this. Born again means this from the beginning of the Bible, the end of the Bible. Here's what it means. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. Listen to me. You can go to church every day of your life. You can graduate from seminary, get a title called pastor, go pastor a church, die and go to hell. 
Because that's not how you get to heaven. You get to heaven because you're born again. Born again means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. Now listen to what I'm going to say to you because it's a shock. Are you ready? you got to hear this. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It always has been all or nothing. It always will be all or nothing. And God forgive us in American churches, we have watered that down for 250 years. It's all or nothing. And I'll prove it to you by the scripture. May I? The last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking. He says, I'm coming again. Don't you know he is? And I don't know when he is. Might be tonight. When you least think about it, least think he's coming, that's when he's going to come. And he says, when I come, listen to what Jesus says, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Oh my goodness. Again, what a crude, rude statement. I'll vomit you from my mouth. Did you know what he just said? He said, people that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all and are not going to make it. I didn't say it. He said it. Are not going to make it. Because when he comes back, he's going to vomit you from his mouth. What's lukewarm? Let's define it so we're all on the same page. Is that okay? Lukewarm. Little in, little out. Little up, little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. You know, here's lukewarm. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Uh-uh. You're not against him, but you're not wholehearted for him. Doesn't work that way. You know, you're going to have to be wholehearted for him, giving him all of your heart, giving him all of your life to be born again. And I use the word give it to him because he's not a thief to rob your heart and life. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it. He's not a manipulator to make you do it. No, no, no. He's not going to make... Don't you think he could make you do that? He doesn't. He gives you a free will choice. Will you choose him with all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Will you follow him while you're here on this planet? Or won't you? And that's called being born again. And without that, my friends, you're not going to make it. So you say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, I hear you. Well, how do I give him all of my heart? How do I give him all of my life? Well, let's don't do it your way, and let's don't do it my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. Let's give him our heart and give him our life his way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you. There'll be a day when you're standing before God, you want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the kingdom of God. That's what you want to hear. You do not want to hear. Go from your work of iniquity. I know you not. Because that's, oh, that's the option. And tonight, here you are in this safe, friendly place. You were great listening to the word of God. We sang songs, told you the truth. You were great listening. Why leave this place the same? Why not give God all of your heart and all of your life? Can I ask you a question? Who else paid the price for you? All of your heart and all of your life. No one. The devil certainly didn't pay the price for you. Jesus paid the price with all of his life for you. So you could come to this place of giving him all of your heart and giving him all of your life. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I do it? Let's do it God's way. Again, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go like this. One, two, three. And I'm going to pop my hands together. It'll sound like that. One, two, three. And I'll go bang. When you hear that sound, bang. Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. And you put it right back down. It's that simple. I won't embarrass you. Even though you might feel embarrassed doing it because the people you came with will see you. People behind you will see you. Okay, get over it. It's better to be embarrassed for a moment than to be in hell forever and ever. Nobody's that dumb. But the devil wants to talk you out of it right now. So when you hear my hands count and then hear my hands pop together, bang, 
your hand goes up. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. And tonight I want to give Jesus all of my heart, give him all my life. I want to be born again tonight and forever. And tonight we'll pray that prayer together and you can get right with God and you can get into his presence for the rest of your existence on this planet. Why not? Tonight is your night. Don't let anything talk you out of it. You know you need to do it. And it starts this way. I'm counting to three. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your heart, get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your life, get ready to put your hand up. If you're one of those people that are not sure, make sure. You know, if you're saying to yourself, wait a minute, I prayed with Billy Graham once, or I prayed at a harvest crusade, that's great. But did you just say a little abracadabra magical formula that you think is a prayer that God's so stupid in heaven that he hears that and says, they said the right formula, they get to come into heaven. No, no, no. He hears your words, but he watches your heart. How does he watch your heart? Through your life. So if you haven't given him all of your heart and all of your life, guess what? Then today, you need to give him all of your heart, give him all of your life. Today is your day of salvation. I'm counting to three. Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one. Thank you. God bless you. There's two back over here. There's three. Thank you. There's four. There's five. There's six. There's seven. There's eight. There's nine. I see you pointing over there, but I don't see it. Wave at me if you're over in this section. They're pointing at somebody over here. There's eight. Uh, I don't see it. I don't see. Oh, there, there, there over. Oh, I got you. Nine. Cool. All right. There's nine. Anybody else? Real quick. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Anybody else? There's nine. There's nine. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on. I know there's ten. I'm a greedy little pastor. And I love numbers. There's ten of you. I know there is. I can feel you. And I already counted you nine. Thank you. Anybody else? I'll just go through one more time. Whoever needs to get their hand up, you know it's you. Let me see your hand. Anybody? Anybody else? Where are you, number 10? Where are you, number 10? Where are you, number 10? I see that little hand right there. I see that hand back there. So that's 11. That's 12. Uh, 10, 11. Now, because I only went this far, I get to go further. Where are you, 12 over on this side? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? You know you need to get your hand up, but you haven't yet, but you know you should. Anybody else? There's, where are you? There's 11. Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 11 wise people. <laughs> Hallelujah. All of you that are 11, all of you that raised your hand, you're serious. 1 through 11. I want you to get all your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff. Now watch this. If, and I noticed a couple of children, only two out of 11 that were children. Parents, do not stay back. Bring those children that raised their hands. I promise you, like Deborah, they'll remember it. She remembers when she was a little child and her mom walked up forward with her and she gave her heart to Jesus, changing her entire existence. Parents, don't do the wrong thing and not come with him. All 11 of you that raised your hand, you're serious about God, get your stuff. By the way, if you're number 12 and you didn't raise your hands, not too late, you can come to 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. All 22 of you that need to get your hand up. So you thought you got out of it. You didn't. God knows who you are. I want you to get your stuff at the same time. Get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. Let's stand and welcome them. No one leave right now. Let's let these people come forward. Come on now. Come, 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 come. Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. Come on, you come out of the family room. Just come.
Well, I think there's more than 12 of you up here in front. Thank God you came. Put a smile on your face. This is the best. Listen to me. This is the best moment of your life for the rest of your life. You're going to get any better than this. <laughs> I promise you. Now here, you see this guy waving at you? This is Pastor Joel. He's a really cool guy. No weird stuff goes on. I promise. I'm really weird. If you think I'm weird, you should see Pastor Dan this weekend. He's really nuts. And uh, so he, he's really weird. But guess what? No weird stuff goes on. He's going to pray with you, give you some free information. I wrote this little booklet, Welcome to Your Destiny. And it's like, follow it. It's so simple. Because now that you're saved, in a moment or two when you receive Jesus, what to do next? I mean, what does God want? Okay, that'll help you to do that, that little booklet. So read it, don't just throw it away. And then get back to church. They'll tell you about a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. People will meet you before church service, help you and go through some things with you, and you're going to get absolutely blessed. I want you to make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right over there. Come on, everybody, give the Lord a great big praise.